Is this only the screen visible, right? Okay. So hello, hello everyone. I am Atul Swami. I work with Veritas as a software engineer, and uh, I am accompanied by my colleague uh, Mahesh Kadve, who is a performance engineer with Veritas. Okay. So today we are going to see what are scalable cloud architecture and what our product does it to solve it and does it to solve that problem. Okay. So this is the does it take time? This is the agenda for this session. One is we are going to just going to look up briefly about cloud computing basics, and then we are going to look at a scalable storage architecture for private clouds. Okay. So, uh, so basically, what is cloud computing? Cloud computing is a uh, on-demand de on delivery of IT um, resources and applications via the internet. Okay. What does it mean? Like. So previously what used to happen is that if you wanted a machine, you would raise a request or some kind of ticket mechanism and you would have to depend on that person for resources. So now what has happened? So that is like a cumbersome process and a, uh, unnecessarily delayed process. So with cloud computing, these disadvantages have been removed. Okay. So nowadays, uh, because of the advent of the cloud computing, uh, a user doesn't need to uh, wait for the hardware to be allocated, the storage to be allocated and the network resources to be allocated for it. He can just do it uh, right on a uh, few clicks so by doing just a few clicks on it. So uh, there, are, there are basically five characteristics for cloud computing. Okay, one is on demand. So um, no matter what the time, uh, what the time is, you just have to order the machine and it will arrive with you. Okay. Another one is the elasticity. If you find that uh, the number of nicks on it are one less, they are not suitable for your usage. And if you find that the storage is uh, incompatible with your storage needs, so you can just expand it. So that is called elasticity. So that is the reason why Amazon Cloud calls it EC2, Elastic Cloud 2. Okay. Then resource pooling, right? So previously, what used to happen that uh, there were two two computes or two nodes that I had. So one was uh, on one of the compute, the resource consumption was 50%, whereas on the other compute, it was 150%. Um, so in that case, uh, the fifty percent capacity of that particular compute used to get wasted. But with the advent of the cloud, you can make sure that you you utilizing both the resources completely. Okay. Uh, metering. So previously, what used to happen, you used to order all the hardware required for you in advance. Okay. So, but because of the advent of the cloud computing, now uh, you can order it on demand as we are saying, right? But and there is some. Um, so how how do you going to charge it, right? So uh, there is a one metering capability in cloud that helps and that segregates that what a particular user is consumption compared to the other user. Okay. And self-service as you don't have to rely on system admins to well, these admin jobs are kind of redundant nowadays because of the advent of the cloud. Okay. I'm just going to run through the couple of slides because we are short of time. Okay. So there are basically uh, three deployment models for cloud. One is the public cloud, which are uh, off-premise. Um, that means everything is managed by that on Google Cloud Platform. Okay. Uh, and uh, of course, the uh, pricing is also flexible. Like you are not going to pay pay upfront. Like if you have a, a need of say one TB, you are not going to pay uh, for one TB storage upfront. You are going to Pay as as and when you are utilizing that amount of storage, as you as and when you are utilizing that amount of compute and bandwidth. Whereas in case of uh, there is one another type which is private cloud, okay, which is on premise. The headache is with the uh, with the user to create a particular cloud, and um, uh, it is all private infrastructure. It it allows better control and it is secure of course. So the main reason why folks are not migrating to public cloud heavily. There is still some migration, but uh, security is one of the important considerations why people are not moving to public cloud. So private cloud, you can make sure that none of your data is being shared with other uh, uh, cloud provider. So uh, that is one of the reason. And recently there, there was one instance like in uh, one of the Amazon clouds, uh, system admin did some uh, run some script and that caused outage for a couple of banking systems and uh, other providers. Okay. Uh, so um, 
uh, and there's one this hybrid cloud which is kind of uh, connect the cloud between the public and private cloud what hybrid cloud does is that uh, so if i have a use case i have some non critical data which i can just uh, uh, just uh, place it on some other machine so i can place it on public cloud and uh, if i want if i have some uh, my critical data i can place it on private cloud so uh, most of the like uh, uh, so you would ideally want your hot data to be in a private cloud and uh, so so um, and uh, passive data in public cloud. So hybrid cloud kind of combines these two, uh, gets the best of both these uh, clouds, and try to utilize them. Okay. So uh, just an offshoot of this is that uh, we have a one product which allows to do that effectively. So Veritas resilience resiliency platform. It actually does a DR from your private cloud to the public cloud if there is some outage in your network. So please feel free to stop me if you think that I'm going too fast because. So there are some terminologies which are uh, explained away. So what are today's uh, industry trends? So previously there was all sand, right? A few years back, sand was the most popular storage net, uh, storage way, right? But now folks are moving back to direct rest storage, dash, um, which is also known as server sand. So, uh, so uh, the applications have become such that uh, in, in case of sand storage, uh, they were not able to uh, satisfy the application IO needs or the performance needs of an application, of a distributed application in general. And because of which dash storage are kind of getting popular again. So this is some of the reports like there have been a, 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 a the server sand has increased in 45, 44% in the last couple of years. And uh, that is going to uh, go on further. Then there is adoption of SSD in, in flash storage devices. Okay, so um, most of you know that SSD are quite uh, fast in uh, random read write kind of workload, right? Whereas uh, HDDs are good in sequential reads. So um, adoption of SSD has increased, and the price has also come down because of which. Uh, this, uh, this kind of storage is getting popular. Availability of hyperconverged solutions. Okay. So previously there weren't, weren't any hyperconverged solutions. They were in some bits and pieces, but now the hyperconverged solution has increased. So what are hyperconverged solutions? Those are kind of a, uh, you look at the entire system as a one single unit, like you, um, you have compute, you have network, you have storage, you have database. That is completely looked as one single unit. Rather than looking at them as separate, uh, one storage unit is there, there's a separate piece of software for that, then there is a network piece of software for that, right? This, there's still pieces of software for those things, but uh, hyperconverged solutions basically uh, uh, treats them all as a single unit, okay? Then um, uh, every everything as a service, people want like, uh, whether it is a database as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, people don't want everything to be paid upfront. So that is the reason, and uh, uh, as a service, it helps, it helps in uh, going to the market, go to market uh, mechanism very fast. So uh, you can go to test, uh, uh, dev and test to production very fast. And also increase, increased adoption of OpenStack has also helped it in a bit. These are some of the big MNCs that are currently uh, using or trying OpenStack in a big way. So, uh, so this is, these are some of the trends of OpenStack and cloud, uh, private cloud reference. Okay. So uh, software-defined storage market has increased by 40%. Um, so some, I would just give you a brief idea about what software-defined storage is. Software-defined storage means actually you are uh, you are not going to rely on the uh, hardware provider for that software. Okay. The software is going to manage the hardware in respect of what commodity. Uh, hardware is underlying in, in it. Okay, so it would provide uh, benefit 
aspects like uh, deduplication, um, virtualization, then uh, uh, you can say um, redundancy management, and all those kind of things. So, a software is going to manage the underlying hardware without you have to manage it. So, these are some of the quotes uh, from uh, the Research Institute of 451 Research. 30% of uh, private cloud users have migrated applications or data out of uh, a public cloud due to cost, security, and control drivers. So that is the reason why uh, folks are moving back to private clouds um, um, from the public clouds. Okay. So you can find. So these are all compute. Okay, and uh, this the underlying storage over here shown is a storage pool. Okay, so there is one VM. Uh, this is how the legacy convert solution worked. So th this green VM, okay, this would have three copies basically. One is over running over here, other is running over here, other is running over here. So you are basically wasting two by three capacity of your uh, storage because you are having redundant copies of that particular VM. Okay. Why do you have copies? Basically, you want to protect your VM from failures, right? So uh, that is the reason we keep uh, three copies in the traditional storage environment, like Nutanix or even uh, even Sam does that. It copies and uh, it keeps three copies of the data. Okay, uh, VM sprawl is one of the most common uh, issues with these these kind of scenarios with the replication of data kind of thing. The, uh, uh, in some cases, it has been identified that if, if you if you delete that particular VM, the green VM, those in that case, the uh, backup copy of that uh, VMs would not be deleted. Or if there's some failure on that, and you're utilizing utilizing one of the uh, VMs, then the other you, uh, uh, VM is not used actually. VM copy. You're trying to bring you're trying to increase that redundancy again. So that is kind of a scenario where we call it as a VM sprawl. So this has been uh, found that uh, it has increased the uh, storage utilization by 30 percent and that is effectively your dead space so there is no automated way to move out these inactive vms okay and uh, so uh, there are some data management windows right you would run uh, a backup on your on your storage and you would do some scans antivirus scans and ETL extract transform and load kind of workload. So there, there are no basically storage of hosting capabilities because these these kind of uh, these scenarios should not ideally affect your compute. But because your storage and compute are located in, are located in the same space, you are actually overloading that uh, particular compute and which is uh, kind of hosting important hot data on it. Okay. And VMs also get impacted by the noisy neighbors. So, so I think it's generally a cloud terminology where uh, on, a, a, on a particular particular computer, if you have three VMs and one of them is hosting, say, uh, OLTP kind of workload and an, 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 another one is hosting MySQL. So in that case, the OLTP kind of work, uh, workload would eat up all your resources. So in that case, you are not making justice to the MySQL kind of workload uh, to have its own bandwidth and to have its own uh, resource utilization. So that is kind of called as a noisy neighbor. So there is a bursting of some by that, the, um, in the IOS, the amount of IOS done by that particular VM is huge because of which all the resources are getting uh, um, choked up. So uh, with this, we have come up with a solution called Hyperscape for OpenStack. It is brought by Verita. So, um, oh, uh, so this this solution basically provides enter, enterprise class capabilities to private clouds, uh, mainly to OpenStack, and we are also coming up with a container version of it. So OpenStack cl uh, cloud, as, as you have, uh, as um, Jason explained, right? It is an infrastructure as a service kind of thing, cloud. And which helps uh, customers or um, users to set up their own clouds, private clouds. I haven't used the open stack, but this other side has uh, blocks, the storage also. Yeah, center. Center. 
Yes. Similar services we have provided. Yes. Right. So, uh, in this architecture, we have the compute plane, compute nodes here, four particular compute. Okay. Uh, and then on those computes, on those hypervisors, you, you have a hyperscale layer sitting on it. Okay. okay. And on the on top of that, you have VMs running on it. Okay. So, uh, should I complete the animation and then explain? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will mm -hmm. We are doing differently than the uh, self on utilities kind of uh, software is that. So this is the compute plane. Okay, all your high end resources are placed over here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you have also SSDs over here. Okay. Uh, which are quite costly. So that's why you want to make make sure that you are using them max, at the max. Okay. We have a hyper hyperscale layer on top of those computes. Okay, and then we have VMs. Okay. So. The VM is running over here. It will have a full image over here. And what we are going to do is that we are just going to put the delta. So the animation is gone. Actually, it would, uh, I'll just reverse it. So that would kind of explain. Okay. So what it would do is that as and when the application is making I/O over here, it would also transfer. It would also redirect the I/Os to the other computes. Okay, depending on the flavor. So as we have VM large, VM small flavor in OpenStack, we have created our own flavors on top of them, and the uh, uh, kind of uh, increase the redundancy level of that particular VM. So what would happen is that only a delta is transferred to the other computes. Okay, if you check, the delta is here and here. Okay. In that case, if this node goes down, okay, then IOS can be served from the delta, one of the two delta. And if, even if this node goes down, then the IOS can be served from the remaining delta. So it can tolerate two levels of failure again. It can tolerate innumerable, but at the at a if um, two failures happen at the same time, simultaneously two failures happen, then what happens? As and when the IOS are being done, we also have one periodic sync to the data plane layer, data node. So what are these data nodes? Data nodes is the data plane layer of our software. It is actually kind of a, a cheap version of the hardware. Okay. You, you won't have uh, that kind of sophisticated uh, hardware over it. Uh, and um, um, you would be, you would, you would not be wanting this to be put in the compute plane. So you would, a data plane would have huge amount of storage. basically. It, it would act as a kind of a, a backup kind of thing. So we, as and when we are taking periodic things, we are taking a, we are, we are doing a full copy of that VM, okay, and we are also doing the delta, the 15 minutes, okay, configure it, 30 minutes to uh, to that layer. So in case if any VM goes down and you want to recover that particular VM, you can do using this periodic sync, okay. So you are effectively you are, you are saving two, uh, two by third capacity of your storage, uh, and that on the costly compute side of the storage and the compute plane itself, okay. So, delta is nothing but uh, whatever the data that we accumulate for last 15 minutes. Uh, and periodically, we see that. So, ultimately, if, if you consider the time series, then delta is nothing but 15 minutes versus of the real data. Now, that versus we store on the data plane. So, every 15 minutes, we send that version that we have accumulated and send it to the data. Now, if, if you consider as a full image, it will be last 15 minutes will be in the delta and the, the past all the data will be in the data. So if you combine these two both, then you will get a full image. So so there will be one full image which will be a local on the VM. Okay. And the remote the the copy or replica of that will be only delta on the computer plane and the, that will be the last 15 minutes rights. And all past rights will be accumulated on the data. That's how we yeah. So you can have as many as data you want. So, but you won't have a full image on all of them. You will have only deltas on three of the compute plane, but 
rest of the virtuals will be accumulated on the data. So only the delta is replicated to the data. Yes, which is uh, the time can be configured whether you want to keep it last 15 minutes or 30 minutes depending upon your requirements. But yeah, by the point Till like my hostel mode gets uh, duplicated or something. Yeah, happens. if there is any failure happens, then you need that full image. You know? Yes, you will require full image. Then uh, you will have delta over here, and okay. the virtuals will be uh, synchronized or hydrated from your data plane to to a big copy. So as a copy of the full image, written copy. Of the so as I explained, it will be delta plus virtual which is stored on this. So in case of failures. Uh, this this story layer can be directed to your rival to the data plane or as a you know, copy on demand, you can say. At the same time, there is a parallelly, there is hydration process which is going on, which will copy the Holding. whatever is the remaining part. So whatever is there apart from last 15 minutes data that will be hydrated from data plane to a particular computer. So so we 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 create the full image on the uh, Reflecting node whenever there is a failure of the source. So, so we construct the full image on the reflecting node. Is it VM HA? Then if one VM goes down, it will be. Yes, 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 yes. it will be fully. Because I was will be served from there, from the reflection, uh, replicating uh, host. Delta will give you data for last 15 minutes, and if there is any miss hmm. on the compute plane, it will be redirected to the data plane. And at the same time, there is a addition which is also going on. So basically, the intention over here is to not choke the primary compute plane with the uh, redundant copies of the virtual machine. As uh, Mahesh has said, only hot data would be there in last 15 minutes or last 30 minutes data would be there on the compute plane. And if there is say some IO miss, which is not there in 15, 20 minutes, if there's some read that is not there in that extent, then we are going to redirect data load. Okay, of course, there would be some per performance impact if you're going to read from the secondary Storage, but still the impact is not that huge. So the hydration process actually happens in a sequential manner. Uh, so we chow, we hydrate. Uh, 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 I mean, there will be a copy from this sequential storage to this sequential storage, and the HDDs uh, are tuned to tune for a sequential volume. So so that the hydration rate will be. You can say we can hydrate at the rate of one GB per second. If, if that is the case, uh, total hydration time will be, um, let's say, within 15 to 20 minutes, you will be again back on the same same level performance that you was on the on the source host. But you will be save a lot of space with with respect to. Uh, uh, I mean, you will save a lot of space on the compute plane, which is costly. Awesome. So the thing is actually for compute load, we'll be using triple S deep disk. Probably for data unload, we can uh, use uh, some cheaper disk. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we recommend SATA, then uh, you can be yeah. with high storage capacity, maybe 8 GB or 16 GB of uh, storage space. Then as on compute plane, where latency matters a lot, we recommend 10 to 15 GB. Or or if it, if you really your uh, latency requirements are too low. Then we may recommend all flash. You may have you may have a PCI based uh, PCI based SSD as a printed cache, and SATA SSD as a uh, tier one for a compute plan. So tier zero can be PCI based SSD, and tier one can be SATA SSD. If you have that configuration, then you can actually get around hundred k ops throughout. That will be too high for in any OLED application. So these are some of the benefits that we we don't allow VMs cross because we are not going to take the full copy of that name. We don't allow that. Okay, no need for VM storage in primary uh, tier. So if there's some dead VM, we don't keep any storage of it. We immediately delete it. Okay, when we take the backup of the VM, we take the entire backup in the configuration of it, right? We want to spawn that particular VM. Right? So, 
we take the computation backup also and so that OBM can respond on the uh, reflection target for the filter. Just one, just to add, uh, for us, DDM is nothing, uh, the one which is not, the one which is not acting, uh, there is an actual level of happening. So it, it could be in a shutdown state, it could be idle. So we can see is that. And uh, if there is no hangover activity happening, it would like more than one hour. So we can just kind of all idle. So, so rather than occupying that full image directly on the system, we can actually hydrate it. We can actually delete it, and uh, whenever there is the iOS, we can hydrate from the data, depending upon the size. And, uh, so if the VM is uh, not used for a certain period of time, uh, obviously it will get. Uh, yeah, I mean, then no there, is no, there, is no, there is no no point having that storage uh, of being yeah. lying on the compute plane, which is uh, costly, right? So, so better you move it to the data plane, which is already there. I mean. If last 15 minutes there is no iOS, that means all the versions are actually accumulated on the data. So whenever there is a requirement, when there is iOS comes, we can you can uh, we can handle it uh, back. But it will take time, no? Actually, if I... it will take time, but yeah, yeah the, the, you can put a policy. Uh, if it is a shutdown screen, then uh, uh, if it is idle and if the size is less than let's say 100 GB or so it's on size, depending upon, you, you can consider your own policy, but there is a way uh, you can stop VMs from the uh, uh, ideal uh, VMs occupying space at the computer. Right? So the, the intention is that to uh, to affect the, uh, to keep on the application I was happening without affecting its performance as far as possible, right? So we have predictable I/O performance kind of in QoS. Um, this is kind of SLA-based IOPS for VM. So what SLA-based IOPS for VM is that? In case of noisy neighbors, if a particular VM is doing more I/O than uh, it should ideally do, and not uh, basically choking the other VM, so you can set that particular policy through UI also command line, and you can make sure that my this particular VM shouldn't get say 20, less than 20k or 15k of IOPS. Okay. It should be above 15k IOPS. Okay, you can do that. And even if there, there is some noisy neighbor, it would be limited to a particular extent and it would it would not be allowed to uh, go beyond the IO needs of it. Zero backup window. Okay. So generally what happens is that you try to do regular backup on this computer plane. Okay. So whenever you are doing uh, backup scans, you are affecting the weird performance. So by adding this data plane over here, we are, we are making sure that uh, a customer can do, do some integration with the uh, data plane and take the regular backups without affecting the compute plane. Okay, so uh, this is called storage of hosting capability. No impact to the primary compute. So we already have one product, NetPack, which is quite popular. So we have integration provided between that. So you can take a regular backup from the data plane onto the net backup. Okay. So as Mike said, explained, right? Data plane pointing. And copies of the data. So you would have uh, 15 minutes periodic thing being done, which would have all the data in it. Okay. Rapid VM provisioning. Okay. So there's any failure, your VM application files are not easily affected, and you can immediately uh, switch on to the other uh, compute. Okay. All hosting and optimize for sequential IO. All your products are only for OpenStack or other? So, uh, so uh, we have container version also, so uh, uh, which is on Docker, and OpenStack is on, on the first version we started with OpenStack. Okay. Do you have anything on the you know distribution, Linode, or the, the Azure, or the other cloud providers? Uh, no, no. This is so they have their in-house. In-house, right? right. So, um, basically, we are addressing the private cloud space. So if you are going to go with that, so you are effectively moving to public cloud, right? So, in fact, uh, Red Hat and uh, Canonical are one of our important partners. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, as we have said, we have resilience. You can define that you know, this is my low important uh, compute or VM, 
I can set no resiliency to it. You don't care basically about that. And if there's some high priority VM, you would want to set the resiliency to the maximum level. Okay. You can determine number of copies per VM, adjust resiliency to real needs at the flavor. So, so, so basic idea is like why to have three copies for all the data if that is that is not required. So, say if a data doesn't give me, you know, uh, oh, a flexibility to say that I, I really do not want to put in this data. I just I don't want resiliency. That is not available. And as a customer requirement, it, it may be. I mean, why why do we add cost for the need for a, for unimportant data for a customer? So, so that to address that, we have come up with the SLAs, uh, SLAs as well as uh, SLS um, that defines its your uh, performance level uh, expectations and resiliency level expectations. You can define that, and depending on that. Uh, you will get the service. So if, if you say you want zero resiliency, it is possible you can create a business using zero resiliency. If you want a resiliency of one, two, or three, you, you can say that and you will ensure that data is replicated on that one copy, or we will keep that many copies of the data. So it, it is uh, resiliency defined by your own SLR Uh, so, other thing is reduce hardware needs at the compute level. You, you require less hardware. Okay. And leverage community hardware. Okay. There is uh, leverage community hardware means the hardware which is amply available, which is kind of cheap hardware. You can use that. Right. So, the reason why cloud basically become popular is that uh, previously what used to happen is that if there are certain needs, if, if you require more storage, if you require more computing power, you had to disintegrate the older. Uh, compute and co bring the new compute, right? So, uh, so that is the reason. So, uh, say if, if you had two computes and you wanted to use both of them, right? So, and that is the reason uh, why OpenStack and these kinds of clouds came into picture. We are leveraging whatever hardware you have, basically. Okay. So, uh, there is no vendor lab locking. Uh, so, if, if you're already, in, say, uh, using VMware ESX, right? You are locked with that particular license. And it is completely software because of which your hardware costs get reduced. Software, we are not relying on a particular soft hardware vendor to provide a software capability. We have our own hardware layer which can talk to any hardware. So even if the hardware is quite old, you can have it in your data center and make maximum use of it. Do you want to add something? Nice. Sumesh, so, do you want to take this slide? Performance slide? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we provide SLS. So we provide uh, customer flexibility to define their SLS. Uh, and one of the key key expectations uh, or key requirement from the customer would be to define the performance level for a, for a given customer. Um, so, so, quality, we provide a quality of service for each flavor. Um, uh, we can define uh, we can define performance level for each of the VMs that we are working. For example, here you can see uh, there are three performance bands. Uh, red one is the lower lower one. So I want performance in the range of let's say 100 to 1K. I want then I have a requirement for a certain application who 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 who, who requires uh, uh, IOPS in the range of 1K to let's say 5K. So I can define a second uh, band or second flavor, which defines my performance level from 1K to 5K. And there will be third, uh, third work, third kind of third, third work, third kind of workload which is which demands very high IOPS. So I can set SLA for that as a mean of 10K and max as as much as possible. So so here I can define mean and max as for each flavor. And uh, I will ensure that at least minimum messages are guaranteed for a VM. So, uh, I, so, so for example, whatever is the environment, uh, whatever is the multi tenant, uh, whatever is the concurrency on that particular compute. Uh, in, in the cloud, 
uh, you really do not have any control where the next VM is going to be launched. And it is possible that it will be your whatever the new new VM is launched that could be your next neighbor. So and we, you really do not know what will be the uh, IOs or workload that will be running on that. So because of this new neighbor, it is possible that your storage uh, your storage capacity is uh, shared by this new neighbor and he is uh, uh, grabbing most of the storage capacity. Uh, that is actually a uh, noisy neighbor scenario. Uh, but using this quality of uh, service feature, we are ensuring that at least minimum SNS for each flavor is maintained. Uh, and definitely using the local SSDs, uh, uh, we use uh, these SSDs as a write back cache as well as read cache. And uh, uh, by using this uh, uh, the cache, we are able to accelerate the performance for your workload. And, uh, and since all our data is actually written on the write back cache, uh, all our uh, replicated data also go hit on the remote SSD. The total cost, the total latencies for providing this SLA is actually minimal. So uh, even if you increase number of copies to let's say two or three, you won't see latency increase just for copying it to or just keeping for uh, keeping the three copies of your data. So latencies are always uh, low. Uh, if, uh, and they are not directly proportional to how many copies that you are storing from your data. So I will just explain you uh, about uh, uh, how this is going to demonstrate how we maintain the uh, quality of service. So I have five VMs. One is running TPCC workload. TPCC, work, TPCC is a industry benchmark for OLED uh, It uses uh, it, uh, I, I have TPCC workload uh, running using uh, with Oracle as a backend, and TPCC is a um, uh, standard for OLED. It, it, it is given by the spec. And there are three uh, uh, four uh, noisy neighbors uh, um, which are running FIO. FIO is a very lightweight IO generating uh, tool. You just give certain uh, parameters like you want random uh, random workload, random regret kind of workload, and you, you, you can specify how much percentage of the uh, and that, uh, what is the ratio of uh, what is the debate ratio of that workload? There are multiple parameters that we can uh, provide to FIO to generate the IO workload. Now, uh, uh, you can see I initially started TPCC workload. Uh, and you will see it was generating IOs uh, in the range of 40k to 50k. Right? Uh, uh, and while and it, it was continue till let's say time series uh, till next 90 uh, minutes. At this point, uh, at let's say 99 uh, seconds, I introduced first multi member uh, that was running FIO FIO workload. The moment I started FIO, uh, I, I started this noisy neighbor, you could see the performance of this TPC has dropped. But as, as I say, uh, the TPCC SLA is configured as a minimum 20K and max as a 50K. So it came down, but it maintained its SLA. Uh, without this TPCC workload, it could have, the bronze or noisy neighbor could have taken uh, maximum uh, uh, bandwidth of the storage. But because of QoS, uh, it able to reach up to 10k, but uh, and noise uh, and TPCC workload has come at the 30k. Uh, then uh, again after some some time, I introduced noisy neighbor two, and now you will see the TPCC workload has come down, but it 
didn't come down below 20k. It maintained its SL. And uh, thereafter, what, how many, whatever the number of transient neighbors that they introduce, I will ensure that the, uh, or the system has ensured that TPC is at least best 20k. And now, uh, now you will see the uh, noisy neighbors, they are getting affected. They are, their share uh, getting, uh, their storage bandwidth is getting shared among themselves and not of the TPC. For example, uh, when there was only noisy neighbor one, this machine used to get 10k. But as at the end, you will say, everybody is now, all the noisy neighbors are getting 5k, around 5k of uh, alerts. So we ensure that at least Excel for each of them is So this was, these are some of the uh, demos that we have done in a couple of sessions, actually, in GHCI and Red Hat Summit that have to be sent in Boston, right? Over there also, we, we did the same demo. The way it computes, basically, 40 VMs running on it, as Mesh said, the workload of FIO randomly, and eight parallel jobs were run, okay? And the storage hardware was Fusion IO SSD. The native SSD performance is 220K IOPS randomly, 40k or 4k per computer. Okay. But the hyperscale performance uh, at this level was uh, 1720. It, is, it, is, it was not reduced, uh, it was near native performance, near native SSD performance. Right? So uh, if, you come, if you multiply 220 by 8 computes, you would get 1760, and the hyperscale performance was 1720. Okay. So we are making uh, maximum use of that particular SSD. So this is the dashboard that we have. It is a uh, additional tab that we have introduced in the Horizon Horizon dashboard. Okay, it looks very similar to Google. Uh, OSP. 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 Eight. 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 And these were the VMs, 14 instances was one. And this is how the uh, dashboard looks like. This is the primary storage, and uh, this is the secondary storage data plane on the computer. Cache is SSD, and uh, persistent storage on those primary computer planes over here. And the IO perform. IO was 17K as we have promised. And the latest year, two was in good shape. So here you, you can see we can provide 1700k at the latency of 76 microseconds. So, so that is what but I say. I mean, the only IRS is not the only parameter that we should to look at the latency as well. So with the eight node, we could provide this kind of work. So the dashboard is pretty simple. It also gives alerts if there's any compute failure, if there's any hardware failure or service failure on the compute plane. Uh, it will also also show you the exact the, which disk has gone bad, which will so that you can recover and move that particular VM to some other VM and make sure that uh, it is in stable condition and then update that particular compute that has some faulty SSD or SDD. Yeah. Another look at another. Uh, Snap off uh, this product. Uh, you will see now IAPS we are getting is around 2.45 and that is uh, uh, around 2000 k, 2400 k, uh, and latency is again 1.2 milliseconds. Over here, instead of 40 VM, we are increased uh, uh, increase per, per VM VM density from 5 to 20 and be able to get. So now you can see in the cloud there are around 160 games. Uh, each one is getting around 1.2 milliseconds of latency.
is workload running of all the VMs. All the You can look at more details in this uh, product by visiting veritas.com. Over there, we have hyperscale purpose like that. And uh, you can, of course, go through the videos and other things and check how it fares better. And uh, openstack.org, we have used openstack heavily. Okay. And uh, we have already released 1.0 version of our product. And we are going to come up with the community version of the, community version of the product. Uh, in mostly November and December, so that developers can try on their laptops. <laughs> yes, sure, sure. Yeah. Is it true? Is that channel lock? No, no, no. no. <laughs> so anybody can draw on there and track it. Okay. And it will just ping so that we will teach you how to pattern this stuff. So that you oh. can yes, yes. We are not going to do anything, but hmm. we will help you to get it. Get it. Yeah. Yeah. for the Come in the tradition. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And by the way, I would found one performance tab regarding the two and so on. It would be good if you can link it with that also. Okay. Yeah, so here you will find in the open stack lab performance tab. Yeah.